Hi, my name is Ken Ward. Uh, welcome to my yard. I'm here with Rafina Ward, who is using my my smartphone to record some short videos talking about our yard, particularly the trees that are here, the, the native tree species. This is kind of in honor of Arbor Day. First, I'm going to uh, talk a little bit about native plants and trees and so forth in your yard. We we've been nature nativizing our yard for a few years now and uh, we recommend it. Uh, natives tend to be healthy and hardy when they're growing in their natural habitats. They support other populations of critters, especially insects, which are so important to an ecosystem for pollination as food sources and so forth, especially for birds. And I'll be mentioning that some when I, as I talk about the different trees. But we'll start here uh, with a tulip poplar, also known as yellow poplar. Most foresters call it that. And I'm, it's behind me. It's the largest tree we have in our yard, and it's a uh, it's a important, popular, well-known tree in the eastern U.S. It's the largest tree we have uh, in, uh, in the eastern U.S. As far as how to identify it, uh, I've got a, a twig here with leaves. This is an easy tree to identify. There's, there's no other trees that have leaves like this that are notched at the top and look a little bit like a tulip flower. Uh, this is in the magnolia family. It's not a, it's not a related to tulips, or it's not a poplar. Here is a flower that's about to open, which is a good source of nectar, and that some of our fruit uh, feeding birds will feed on to get the nectar, like Baltimore, it's a beautiful Baltimore Oreo. So we're lucky to have a flower down here that's close to the ground to look at. But this is, again, this is an easy tree to identify. There are other things you can use, the buds in the winter look like a duck's bill and so forth. Uh, still in our backyard and I'm standing by a flowering dogwood, a well-known tree that maybe a good many of you recognize. It's, uh, it's been a while since it flowered, uh, but not that long. Uh, the fruits are starting to develop on the tree now. Uh, of course, this is a much loved tree, but most valuable is an ornamental. Um, but it's also a wild native tree, has insects that need it for food, and, and so it supports the bird populations and so forth. Uh, it is um, disease prone, unfortunately, in, in the wild populations in particular. Uh, a lot of it's been killed, uh, but I think it's probably coming back in a lot of areas where that's happened. Um, it's a useful tree for wildlife. The birds eat the fruits and so forth. The fruits are also useful for ID. Um, as far as ID is concerned, getting into that, uh, the leaves are kind of distinctive. They have arching veins, the leaf veins. I don't know if you can see that, which is uh, arch away from the edge of the leaf. That's a fairly good character. But better than that is these, these things in here that will become fruits later are very prominent, bright red. Of course, they're there only in the fall and the winter as well as the flower buds, which are even more distinctive, but only there in the fall and winter. Uh, it also has this sort of blocky, checkered bark. Bark's always a good thing to learn because it's always there. This is, of course, a mature tree. They're small trees, and it has sort of a blocky or checkered-looking bark that's uh, different than most other trees that you would see. Behind me here is a sugar maple. And this is a tree you can find growing wild in North Alabama. We're kind of at the north, at the southern end of its range. And here are some leaves. These are fairly typical looking maple leaves. And uh, this is a, sugar maple is a hugely valuable tree. Everybody knows it's probably that it's the major source of maple syrup. It is also a great furniture and veneer tree. It's, it's a great wildlife tree, deer browse, for example, uh, and, and probably most valuable as an ornamental and for the tourism industry because it's beautiful fall coloration that you can see, for example, up at Maple Hill Cemetery, which is named for the sugar makers. Uh, as far as uh, identifying this tree, uh, we have four or five different maples here. And the way I tell this one from the other maple is when I look at the, the leaf, if you look between the lobes where I'm running my finger right there, You'll notice it's smooth. Most of the other uh, maples that it looks most like, such as silver maple and red maple, have serration between the lobes, saw teeth. Uh, and in the winter, when the buds are around and you can see them well, this tree has point, small, sharp 
pointy bud, which is different than the, than the other maples that it looks most like. Standing next to a sweet gum, this is a pretty distinctive tree, well known. It's an abundant tree, a lot of times found in bottomlands, but it grows everywhere, and, and in some cases in people's yards. It can, it can be a beautiful ornamental tree, but people typically hate the, the fruits. Most people call gumballs or something such, because you can step on them. They, they, the flowers of the tree stain your sidewalk and so forth. Uh, the best, easiest character this time of the year is probably the, the leaves, which are sort of star-shaped. But notice they do look a, a fair amount like maple. There are also the twigs of this tree. You, I think you can see if I can move some leaves. It, they, they have a, this sort of cor corky stuff in some places growing along the edge of the twig. Now, there's other trees that have that, like wing down, but their twigs are much skinnier and they have other differences. So that's a good character to identify it too. Uh, also, the, the leaves tend to have sort of an antiseptic smell to them when you break, when you uh, tear a leaf. Um, and the fall coloration is distinctive too because there's usually two or three, four different colors there at the same time. It's also a valuable wildlife tree. A lot of the seeds are eaten by ducks and squirrels and, and so forth. Beavers love the bark. Uh, so it's a, it's a valuable tree. A lot of pine foresters consider it a weed. I'll throw that out to kid my, my forestry friends back at Alabama a and a little bit. Just a few feet over and in front of a black cherry, another of our native trees, a really valuable tree for wildlife commercially. Sometimes it's an ornamental. This one's not particularly pretty ornamental. And this tree is prone to a disease called black knot. It causes a lot of oozing sap and so forth and, and kind of messes up the form. This is one of the most valuable furniture trees we have up in the northeast, the same species up there, where it's uh, uh, second only to walnut. Black walnut is a, is a valuable furniture tree. Uh, wildlife, it, it, it produces fruits which are similar to the cherries. Some of the cherries you see in the stores, but much smaller, and they taste pretty good if you get them when they're ripe. And birds and other wildlife just love them. And they're especially useful because they're fruiting at a time of the year, late spring, early summer, when there's not as much stuff fruiting. So they're useful to the birds for that reason. Um, it's a tough tree for people to identify. Uh, I used to teach a dendro course in the forestry program, and uh, it was one of the harder ones for the students to learn when it's a mature tree. When it's young, it's easy. The bark has this really striped appearance on young trees and on branches. It's hard to see on this tree, unfortunately. If you look up there and look at the more silvery bark, or some of it down here, that's what I'm talking about. Uh, if that is all the bark that's on a branch or something, that's very distinctive and it's easy to identify. Uh, probably the best way, though, to identify it is by the odor. If you carve into the bark or you, or you scrape some bark off of a twig or something, it has a burnt, sort of bitter smell. Maybe something like bitter almonds, and almonds are related to, to cherries, by the way.